You're asking me all about why should they use it, should they be involved in DeFi? Because DeFi can actually bring them, you know, this solution, this opportunity, the opportunity that they're not going to have anywhere else where there's no, where the, the things that, you know, obviously Takado is an example of that. Because today, and I, I was in France, and I always, whenever I talk about, or I'm invited to talk about crypto, I always use two main use cases. One is Marhaba and one is Takadao. And, and people, they get shocked about it because they think like they do not even have an Islamic insurance. I mean, think about it. In the UK, there's no Islamic insurance. But tomorrow, inshallah, we can actually have access to an Islamic insurance through uh, Takadao. You understand? 100%. It is very Actually, important. Uh... Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to another bonus episode of Taka Talk Season 2. I am Leila, your bonus host, and today we talk about DeFi, Sharia compliance, Muslims getting involved, and the things you should look out for when they do so. With me today to discuss all of that, I have the privilege of um, introducing Mufti Bilal. Mufti Bilal is the Chief Islamic Compliance Architect at Marhaba DeFi and the founder of the Revival Project. He integrates Islamic finance principles with modern technologies, ensuring ethical Sharia compliance solutions for businesses worldwide. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mufti Bilal, thank you so much for gracing us with your time today. How are you? Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm fine, alhamdulillah. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here today. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. For so where are you joining us from, Mufti Bilal? At the moment, uh, I just uh, came to the UK. I was in France for quite some time now. So I just came to the UK because uh, I work on the revival project that is being launched in, in France. That's why I just came back to the UK at the moment. Hello, Mubarak. Okay, so uh, as you know, uh, as you have already mentioned, you know, I am part of the Marhaba DeFi team, which is one of the first uh, crypto Islamic crypto project uh, in the world that was launched a few years ago. Alhamdulillah, I've been part of this team, you know, ever since, even, even before I even started. So I'm part of the founding uh, member team. Uh, member team. Uh, I have, obviously, uh, from an educational background, I've, I have, uh, you know, I've studied uh, in uh, various Darul Ulum, Darul Ulum Blackburn, and uh, in Bury, I've completed my, uh, you know, my Islamic theology course there, and I've trained as a mufti in, in Blackburn, Darul Ulum, and then I also have my uh, license, my BA, sorry, my BA in banking uh, in law. Uh, I have, you know, uh, alhamdulillah, for the last few years, I've been involved with uh, many things in relation to Islamic finance, specifically helping people, you know, uh, finding uh, Islamic uh, financial solutions uh, in their day-to-day -day life. So I've been involved with the Islamic finance guru, uh, answering, you know, many uh, of uh, the questions that Muslims tend to have in relation to their job, in relation to their investment, uh, etc. Uh, at the same time, I have been involved with the National Zakat Foundation, again, helping people how to calculate zakat, identifying, you know, zakatable asset, non-zakatable asset, deductible debt, uh, etc. And uh, along with that, at the moment, uh, I am launching a new project, uh, inshallah in France, which is called the Revival, and which is going to have, you know, three uh, main branches, uh, education, uh, charity, and also uh, financial and advisory uh, arm as well. So that's uh, in, in a so, nutshell. So that's a, that's a wonderful, you know, uh, resume out there. Um, and I think you're the perfect person for this uh, conversation today. I like the blend of Islamic studies and then, you know, the banking and the finance part of it, inshallah. So maybe let's take it back uh, um, a lot. But before we do that, I have one question. The Revival Project, what are you trying to revive? So we're trying to revive, obviously, uh, the faith and the uh, basic aspect of Islam within the Muslim community, within the French Muslim community. Uh, as that. you probably know, you know, there are many challenges to be uh, a, friend, a Muslim in France and to be a French Muslim. 
lately, obviously, there, there are many things that come into the news, and there are many French Muslims, you know, that are currently leaving France as well to go. They call it, was you know, it Hijra. La, was it La France, je l'aime, mais je la quitte? Oh, this, this is a new book that has uh, been uh, <laughs> released very recently, and it addresses this issue, uh, La France, yeah. uh, la, mais je la quitte. And I think, you know, there, there are a lot of misunderstandings from the Muslim and the non-Muslim community. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have to learn how to live our faith as a minority as much as possible. Uh, I do not feel that there is a reason for Muslim living in Europe, you know, like countries like in the UK. Even in the UK, you know, like people tend to see the UK as a place where uh, it is very open to Islam, it is more tolerant, etc. But believe it or not, there are people that talk about doing hijrah. They do not feel that They, they are able to practice their deen or their religion in the UK, despite all the facilities that we have. So never mind France, you know, like there are people in France who think, oh, we should be doing hijrah, hijrah. But I think obviously this is not the, the platform to discuss in the, the details, but I think, you know, like people need to first understand how to live up their faith, what, understand what is expecting from, uh, you know, from, Allah, from, from us, what, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects uh, from us. Uh, how to practice our deen, understand, you know, the basics of the religion, the basic, you know, the hadith, we, we, we talk about the hadith of Jibreel, when the, he yes. comes and teach the, the, the Muslim ummah about the deen by asking the Prophet Sallallahu a set of questions, understanding all that, and then, you know, understanding other things as well, the importance of halal, for example, you know, the Muslim community as a whole, and this is why we have uh, actors like, uh, you know, uh, you know, Takadao, who comes up with these solutions to help bring the Muslim community from a lower position to uh, something uh, a higher. The Muslim Very community around the world, whether they, 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 they're living in Muslim countries or non-Muslim countries, they are financially very poor. That is a fact. They're very, very financially very poor. And, you know, poverty, with poverty, you're not going to succeed in life. And especially as not, not only as an individual, as but also as a community, well. you're not going to be successful. And for that reason, when you, you bring Dean into uh, someone's life, you also need to address other aspects that is related to this world as well. And one of them is finance. So we're 100%. trying to bring all that as well into, into, in, into the whole picture as well. Thank you world. very much. That is crystal clear. And we see where you're coming from. All right, so let's take it back a little bit for a while and let's do a little bit of story time here. Um, Mufti Bilal, growing up, what made you go into Islamic studies and then banking at the same time? So, of course, it, there is, you know, this yeah. entire expose that you've made already. But I think back yeah. then you didn't know all of this, right? So a younger Muslim Bilal, what, what, was, uh, what drew, drove you to, to these two fields? And which one came first? Yeah, uh, well, first, uh, obviously, uh, the Islamic studies came first, and I will uh, explain why, if it makes sense. It's, first of all, I'm from Reunion Island, so Ile de la Réunion, which is very, very far from here. It's a small island in the Indian Ocean between Madagascar and Mauritius. So I would, I would have said Mauritius, to be honest. Uh, no, I wouldn't say Mauritius because Mauritius is an independent country. Whether yeah, yeah really I mean, no, no, the accent and everything, you know, and the looks. Uh, I, I thought, I thought Mauritius. All right, no, yeah, obviously because uh, Mauritius is where they speak French as well, so yeah. there is some form of similarities when it comes to the accent. And, you know, it's uh, uh, they, they speak Creole and we speak Creole as well. All of the, the Creole exactly, exactly. So that's, why, that's where the accent may, may come from. But uh, yeah, so growing up on the island, Alhamdulillah, although it's a French island, you know, people live in peace there. There's various people, you know, religion has got a very strong, strong place in society there. So Alhamdulillah, we have been practicing our religion. So I have, from a very young age, I had like a, an interest when it comes to Islam. Okay. Despite, you know, living our life as normal French citizen, going to school, where, you know, as you know, hijab was, has always been banned, but, you know, there were some schools, they were, they were 
not saying anything, etc. So you would have, you know, some girls coming with hijab, etc. But but overall, you know, it has never been uh, a question of identity. We never really suffer from an identity crisis like uh, today's uh, youth in France. So all despite growing in, in an environment where we have accepted our um, uh, identity as French, but we never, you know, turn back our identity on the fact that we're Muslim as well. So from a very, very young age, I was interested in Islam. Alhamdulillah, I, I did the... Um, Haves I memorized the Quran from a very, very young age, and by the age of, and for some reason I always had uh, huge respect, and I think that comes from my my dad who always showed me the, the, the respect he had for people of knowledge, for ulama, etc., for the scholars. So from a very young age, I, I thought I decided that one day, inshallah, I'm going to study as well uh, Islamic studies. So then, I, obviously, I ended up traveling to the UK. I studied Islam, etc. I studied Islamic theology. I went back to Reunion. Uh, I, I, one thing I will say, though, is that during our time um, in the Darul Uloom, towards the end, our, um, uh, what do you call it, our, the, the principal of the Darul Uloom, my teacher, Sheikh Yusuf Mutala, the, the late Sheikh Yusuf Mutala, rahimahullah, he had wanted for Muslim scholars to not just go out and work in a masjid, just like that, and become, you know, the local imam. He encouraged us to actually seek further knowledge by going, enrolling to university, getting degrees, and, you know, getting bigger job, and having a bigger impact on the society as a whole through dawah, etc. So sure. I was interested to go back to university, to go to the university, but I didn't know what to study. So I went to Reunion and I heard about the, the, the Islamic banking. Again, it was my dad who told me that he saw it on the news, something something to do with Islamic banking. So that's when I came back to the UK and eventually, uh, at the time, how I did the degree in banking and law, uh, I was advised by um, a mufti who's well-known in the UK as well in the field of Islamic finance, Mufti Barakatullah, Habibullah. Uh, who I met uh, him with, along with Mufti uh, Shikdar, who was uh, a Sharia advisor for Gatehouse Bank, who's still a Sharia advisor, I guess, for Sh Gatehouse Bank. And uh, I, I haven't spoken to them. They guided me. They uh, offered me some advice. And then eventually I decided to do the degree in banking and law. And, you know, I'll, believe it or not, though, uh, from my time studying Islamic theology, I also had an interest when it comes to Buyur, and, uh, you know, mu'amalat, uh, trade, mm. etc. Although I didn't know that there was some the concept of Islamic banking at the time, I really didn't know. But I always had this, this you know, I don't know, maybe it was something like, uh, I didn't know a lot of what I was putting into my heart before yeah, uh, this interest in mu'amalat. So um, two things, I think in your person and in your, in your work, we have a lot of other people getting the rewards, subhanAllah, and getting the ajr for directing you here and there. And as you're saying, you know, Allah putting the, the love of it or the attraction towards it in your heart. Um, it's just, it's an interesting route you took, you know, when people generally want to learn about Islam, they go to the East, you know, they go Middle East, Asia and stuff. So just why the UK? You know, uh, last week actually I was uh, talking uh, to somebody about this. Uh, initially, you see, in Reunion, uh, many people when whenever they went to study, they either went to the UK, they either went to South Africa, or they went to uh, India. Me personally, I had wanted to go to South Africa at the time. And the reason why was because uh, one of the uh, Semin Islamic seminary in South Africa. Uh, every year they would have, you know, Saudi sh shuyukh coming to there and taking the application of whoever newly graduate who wanted to go uh, study further in in Mecca or Medina. So I was actually interested because I had always, you know, thought, you know, one day I, I would really love to go and live in in the. Uh, Mecca or Medina. So I thought, you know what? If ever I get the chance to go and study there, I would love to do that. And me, I thought, you know, this the easiest way to that would be to just go to South Africa and study there. But my teacher of uh, Hibs, uh he met, he actually 
sent me to to the UK. He actually advised me to to go to the UK, and be, and I, I have to say that was one of the best moves uh, I have ever made because I do not think I would have been in the same place had I gone to 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 South Africa. Uh, yeah, Again, was, another. Yeah another redirection of Allah through people and it speaks volume about yourself you know your younger self that you were willing to listen and you were willing you know to 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 follow the elite subhanallah so thank you very much all right so we've covered islamic science banking and finance how about crypto and DeFi? how do you fall into this world uh so really all this started uh years ago uh, initially obviously there, w- there was the hype around bitcoin as you know you know a few years ago i, I guess what was it 20 it was, i think it was just before covid a few, few years before covid and um so i started learning about it started learning about it uh, you know i guess back then you wouldn't have seen that much information that you probably see nowadays you know when it comes to crypto uh, so I started learning about it. It was very difficult to 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 understand some of these aspects at times, uh, and really at the time, you know, it was mainly a learning about what crypto is, and we didn't know that, you know, about DeFi. I had no idea about DeFi, etc. So it was really trying to understand about blockchain and crypto, and then uh, using LinkedIn. So to say that, you know, sometimes <laughs> a website like LinkedIn is useful. Uh, I met with uh, the founder of Marhaba Defi. I met with Nakeib. Okay, I met with Nakeib. and uh, because I saw that Nakeib was a uh, blockchain expert uh, on, on his profile, so I contacted him and I told him that I want to know. I didn't know him. I contacted him and I said I want to learn about. Uh, actually, he was part of IBF Net uh, at the time, okay. and I had done a course uh, at the same time on uh, work f- through IBF. So that's when I saw Nakeb is a blockchain expert part of IBF. So that kind of, you know, motivated me to contact him. So I contacted him and he's the one who really taught me about blockchain and crypto, etc., etc. And from that, and that, this at the time, he told me about the project that he wanted to have to bring, you know, uh, halal solution to Muslim investors when it comes to crypto and uh, DeFi. So the, this journey really started from that time, moment. Another pivotal moment and person, yeah. I guess, in your journey. So did yeah. you have, like, uh, for us, uh, the, the rest of us, um, we who did not study Islamic uh, science, uh, I think many people who come to crypto and the first question is after you know, what is it, you know, when they understand it's like, isn't it haram, you know, did you have that moment of finding out, okay, I'm sure you did, but you will tell us, did you have that moment of finding out, you know, what are the Sharia risks with this thing, um, or were you very optimistic from the get-go? Look, um, in terms of fatwa itself, uh, I was working, you know, before I was working at the National Zakat Foundation, uh, and uh, I was working at the time with another scholar who's very well known in the Islamic finance industry, especially for having written about Bitcoin, is Mufti Faraz Adam. Mm. So me and him, we were working together, and he had just, you know, produced the paper on Bitcoin. And because whenever we... I, because I was leading, you know, the calculation service at National Zakat Foundation, and we were getting already enough lot of fatwas, a lot of, fatwas, uh, a lot, a lot of uh, queries about whether, you know, how to calculate zakat on Bitcoin. Yeah. So I had already discussed that with him. So I knew from the start that Bitcoin was Sharia compliant. Never in my mind. From the moment I heard about Bitcoin, I heard about Bitcoin with Mufti Faraz and. I heard about what it is, how it works, and I knew from the start it was sure compliant. So for me, it was never a case of whether crypto is non sure compliant. Uh, eventually, over the years, I did hear about the other fatwas, the other argument, what ulama are saying, why they're saying it's non-permissible, etc. But 
my my opinion has ne- never really changed and alhamdulillah over the years i can and actually a uh, few months ago i think i have written something about it about why is there a difference of opinion between the scholars when it comes to crypto uh, i mean one thing is of, of course is the fake right uh, but a part of the fake i think there are many other factors that do influence the difference of differences of opinion and uh, this it obviously it took me over the years to understand that what, 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 why is there so much differences so yeah alhamdulillah I, n- I never really had a, an issue with and i always do say to people that remember uh, now obviously because i screen so many tokens etc you know for for marhaba for sahal wallet and so i i i tell people that even if somebody was to believe that bitcoin is non sharia compliant then they will never be able and they should not use the same fatwa to apply to any other crypto outside that like for example one person cannot say you know takada taka token is non sharia compliant because somebody said bitcoin is haram you cannot do that it's two different structure two different product two different everything so yeah i think uh, i i think people might have a lot of questions especially if they're new to this entire environment and sometimes it's a complete barrier right because you've heard somewhere you know a sheikh that you follow say you know it's it's not sharia compliant and then it's just in your mind it's not sure it's like programming and so it's interesting that you didn't have that and you were in circles that you know made it possible um i i just wanted to ask about something yes to those who want to know uh, that's not the topic of this discussion today but if you want to know you know how bitcoin is sharia compliant and the arguments for it we have an amazing uh podcast on our channel please go check that out but today with mufti bilal inshallah we will focus on you know DeFi and the use cases and what you look out for generally speaking and so you've started with marhaba and all of that and you've spoken about the paper you've written on why there is difference of, of opinion despite that it did not change your mind and you continued and i wonder if you wish you know if the world was run by mufti bilal and you had the power of changing people's mind would you want more muslims to get involved into sharia compliant defi and actually what do you define as defi Look, um, I always say to to, to, to people um, that one thing is having a product that is halal and that is Sharia compliant. Does it mean that everyone has to be involved or has to eat? It's like, for example, you know, you have a restaurant, corner restaurant is certified as halal, as Sharia compliant. Does it mean that we all have to go and eat there just because it is... It's, it's run by a master chef, for example, just because it's halal, just because it's cheap, just because, you know, it's accessible. Does it mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wants you to go and eat there only and that you don't eat anywhere else? No, it doesn't mean that. Okay? So, Islamic financial solution, they are, to an extent, same. Okay? It does not mean because something is halal that we have to enforce it on people. However, we have to understand that some of these financial products they they're not just there for uh, how can i say that for for the sake of enjoyment like food okay you eat you're going to go to a restaurant you're going to eat food the best thing you're going to get out of it is enjoyment right but when it comes to fin- islamic financial products or any fi- fi- financial product uh, the the thing is you're not only going to get enjoyment but this can actually have an impact on your life. It can be life-changing. And it can have an impact on society as well. Certain products can be constructed where, you know, people will go from poverty to become rich. Or these products, eventually, they can be structured where society... And we have to also understand the, the, the impact of poverty, that it is said... Um, they say, you know, it's Ali uh, radiallahu anhu who said that, you know, the poverty can actually lead somebody to kufr. It can actually lead somebody to disbelief. That is the uh, how the, that's how dangerous poverty can be. Okay, poverty can lead somebody to sell his faith, to sell his 
his soul, to sell his family, etc., etc., etc. And therefore, you have to work very hard to not be in this position where you are in need of something. You are in need of people. You you are financially dependent on other people. So this is why we we have to. It's not the same as going into a restaurant and eating food and get enjoyment. No, Islamic financial products are very important. Even if it's not for everybody, we're not saying everyone has to go and buy a, a product because it's Sharia compliant. However, we also have to acknowledge the importance of having these sort of product around us because they can change society. Today, the Muslim community, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Obviously, there's a war going on in, in, in Gaza, as we all know. But when you, you look at, we're not, obviously, we're not going to talk about that, but we're just going to look at the uh, Jewish lobby in the United States. They spend nearly 100 million of pounds every year. This is in the public domain. You know, there's nothing hidden about that. This is in the public domain. You can check it uh, online. You will see it. But how much do Muslim, actually, Muslim lobby spend, you know? in the US or in the UK or in France? Probably nothing, probably zero, if, if anything. Why is that? Because we cannot function as a community, not only that, but at the same time, we probably do not have that, that sort of mean to spend that amount of money. So money is very, very, very important. And that's why it's, it's, it's paramount for Muslim to actually get involved when it comes to uh, anything that can bring them money if they can actually put that, use that profit for the betterment of the community later on. We'll be right back after the break. Taka Talks brings you stories from around the world that will help you understand how crypto and Islamic finance can change our lives for the better. Subscribe and follow to keep learning. Later on. You're asking me was... about why should they, use it, should they be involved in DeFi? Because DeFi can actually bring them you know this solution this opportunity the opportunity that they're not gonna have anywhere else where there's no where the, the things that you know obviously takado is an example of that because today and i, I was in france and I always whenever i talk about or I'm invited to talk about crypto I always use two main use cases one is marhaba and one is takado and all and people they get shocked about it because they think like they do not even have an Islamic insurance. I mean, think about it. In the UK, there's no Islamic insurance. But tomorrow, inshallah, we can actually have access to an in Islamic insurance through uh, Takadao. 100%. It, it is very actually, important. Actually, uh, so, sort of in Islamic insurance alternative, mm -hmm. actually, as we've uh, renamed it, because it's really not insurance, even if you think about it. But I love how, subhanAllah, I love how you came full circle because with the example of the restaurant, I was like, yeah, but there are other restaurants, you know, there are other ones that are selling uh, halal, you, know, you can go here, you can go there, it's personal preference. But when we talk about DeFi as well, you look at it with what is the alternative, right? What is TradFi? What is traditional finance? And, you know, if we say that and i don't know your opinion maybe you can jump in and clarify if we say that you know the the economy that is based on debt and riba which is the traditional finance is there and there is this alternative where we can do away a little bit and get a little freer from the riba which is in DeFi, most uh, or sharia compliant DeFi products does it become or doesn't it become a necessity for people who want to get away from riba to at least look into DeFi? Yes, exactly, because, you know, it's very easy to always say that, uh, you know, oh, we're part of the system and it's just out of necessity, etc., because we do not have a choice, etc. Yes, we, it's true. We do not. We are part of a system that we did not create. And uh, does it mean we have to stay in that system forever? No, we have to work towards, you know, it's. It's very good, you know, to write books and to talk about theories that, oh, you know, this is bad, this is bad, you know, riba is bad and this and that. But then, you know, if your product, if, if your solution are always restricted to the same system and you're not to, trying to actually move out of it, of course, change doesn't happen overnight. We're not saying, oh, because we're creating 
Marhaba is creating, you know, for example, product, Takada is taking, uh, creating product, that's it. We're going to be free from the entire system. Now, that's not going to happen. But you have to start from somewhere and over time. And history has shown us everything starts from something. Okay, a big change always happens from something small. Yeah, so you have to start from somewhere and then, you know, you build upon it until you come to, probably we will not see it, but inshallah, there will be a, a place and time where people or at least the Muslim community will not have to depend on this uh, riba system or, you know, this monetary system that we all know is a system, etc. There will be a time, inshallah, that will come. But you have to work towards it. It's not good to just sit there and say, oh, you know, we're part of the system. We've got no choice. What can we do? SubhanAllah. So it speaks to this uh, thing of innovation and being scared of, you know, in, in, in worldly things of innovation to say, you know, this is new, you know, when something is new. You know, remember the TV when it came around. I don't know. Somebody spoke about toilet paper. I was not around. So, but, you know, there, there were, you know, people saying, you know, this is haram. And of course, the Internet, you know, because it has some wrong elements, some elements yeah. that can lead to, 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 to negative things happening, of course. Uh, and we're not saying, you know, jump, you know, headfirst into DeFi and crypto and all of that without doing your due diligence. But each time there is something new, um, there is a period of adjustment and whatever. And generally, once it's well established and people start using it and you cannot do without it, then, you know, we, we uh, loosen the, the reins and people start saying, yeah, you know, so it's okay to use. But in that curve and everything, once we're already here, it's established, Yani we don't have the leverage to actually change something and make sure that our needs as people who care about Sharia compliance are met. Um, do you agree or is there something you want to add on that? Yeah, I mean, and you know, at the end of the day, yeah, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, money, yeah, we have to earn a living in this world. Yeah, we have to earn a living in this world. And that's for everybody, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, okay? There is nothing to be ashamed of, you know? We have to go to work, we have to do investment, we have to do this, we have to do that. And our duty, and, and uh, uh, you know, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to always do it in a Sharia compliant manner, in a halal manner. And for that reason, there will always be a need to create product and solution and a system where it is in line with the teaching uh, of the Prophet with the, you know, with the the, the the lessons that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us in the Quran, etc., etc. We cannot just sit, you know, quietly and think, okay, you know, there's nothing for us to do, blah blah blah, or we are weak and therefore we have to, you know, sometimes you have people that. One thing is, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we always talk about th this fatwa is very famous. Can you buy a house, you know, with a mortgage if it's the first house, if you live in a Muslim, uh, in a non-Muslim country? And then you have scholars who have allowed it based on necessity, based on that. One thing is, is people, you know, saying out of necessity until you find a solution. But the other side, you're going to have Muslim who say, no, I am going to use the halal, halal mortgage, not because it's a necessity, but because there's nothing else out there. And that's it. There's nothing else we can do. And we're not going to find a solution. And we're not going to talk about it. That is completely different. Then it's two different approach. So we have to be very proactive. Yeah? We so have to be proactive. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it seriously. So let's say somebody has been listening um, all to, to, uh, throughout this and they are ready, you know, to look into it. What, um, what, are, what is your advice for somebody who is starting and is looking into it? And especially, what should they look out for? What are the, the threats in terms of Sharia compliance in DeFi? When it comes to the threat, the, you know, this is very interesting. And... Uh, I'm sure you'll tie up with the the, the, the the previous question as well. Is that, you know, when it comes to share and compliance, sometimes uh, uh, this is something I, want, I really want to highlight is that 
sometimes we tend to believe that um, share compliance is only about the riba, it's only about interest. And interest is so straightforward that if in the contract it says interest, that's it, then it's haram. Or we understand interest as, you know, the typical arrangement where you're borrowing money, yeah, and you have to repay it with an interest amount. That's yeah. what people tend to think as of interest. But that is not the case. And specifically when it comes to the crypto world, whenever you have a white paper that says interest, then you have to be kind of careful about it because most likely, or a lot of the time, it is not real interest. They, they have called it interest. They have tried to draw an analogy similar to interest, but it is not interest. Okay? However, can you please unpack what do you mean it is not interest? It is not interest in the uh, Islamic sense, in the fixed sense, meaning they're calling it interest, but in reality, if you were to analyze it from a Sharia perspective, you will realize that this is not interest, but rather it is profit. Some, some sort of sense. return on investment. Can you give us an example so it just... Well, you know, the best example I have in my mind is Uniswap. You know, right, right at the start, when we were presented with Uniswap many few years ago, and when I looked at Uniswap and those, and those time, whether it was in the white paper and somebody's explanation, they call it interest. So they say, you know, the fees that you're collecting, you know, from a liquidity pool is actually interest. When in reality, it is not interest. It's trading fees. And the trading fees is actually share compliant. Yes, obviously the, the, the pool itself needs to be structured in a share compliant manner with you know halal tokens being involved, etc. But the trading fees is got nothing to do with interest. But the way they have explained it, they have made it look like there is lending and borrowing involved, and there is actually interest. And therefore, we thought it was non share compliant. We thought it was haram. I, I, I never forget that. It's only later but, when we re-looked into it, people have explained it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We realized, oh no, actually this is nothing to do with interest. There's not no riba, there's no lending involved. That can happen a lot in the FI space. But the opposite is also true. Sometimes they will explain to you something that looks like there is a trade involved and there is a profit involved. And you as a Muslim investor, you're gonna think, oh, this is absolutely fine, it's halal. But in reality, is absolutely 100% haram because there is riba involved, because there is gharal involved, because there's so many things involved. So people have to understand. People really have to understand that there are danger in the DeFi space because the way things are, are explained and the terminology that are used can differ from one project to another. It can differ because there's no regulation, right? You know, somebody can call it interest, somebody can call it something else. Nobody will come and say to you, oh, this is wrong. So you yeah. have to be very, very careful about that. And so I see that, you know, you're highlighting conflation of terms, you know, and the, the, the need and the importance of looking actually to what is being done rather than how it's being described because they might not have that Sharia, you know, sensitivity to, you know, put the right words in um, for us. Okay, so let's take, let's take actually Takadao as one use case or a case study. Um, how have you been involved with the Takadao team in, you know, building the Takashura product? And for those who do not know, um, Takashura is a technology that Takadao uh, um, builds and it powers uh, insurance alternative DAOs. Those are decentralized autonomous organizations. So it's a technology and, you know, we plug and play into insurance alternative DAOs where people insure themselves or they protect themselves, uh, they protect one another without the need of an external insurance company. And so Mufti Bilal, you've been working with the team for a while now. How is your involvement? And talking about these three aspects that you've mentioned, and I think, you know, the, the, the listeners will want to know exactly what they are, you know, what, how is it unconventional? How is it different in this case study of, you know, Sharia compliant uh, DeFi? Riba, Gharar, and Maysir, inshallah. So let's talk about it. But first, I know that was a mouthful. <laughs> first, just to refresh your memory, you want to know how you've been working with the um, Takadao team. 
So, uh, alhamdulillah, I, I've been involved with Takadao team since, it's going to be a year now. It's going to be a year because I remember I started uh, being involved while I was in Reunion Island last year. So, uh, I remember the first time I spoke to uh, Murad uh, at the time. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, it's going to be over a year because I remember last year as well in Ramadan, I think, uh, there was a, we did like a, a webinar. It was in maybe on Zakat or something like that. So, yeah, it's going to be over a year. So, alhamdulillah, um, been involved with the team. You know, we had like every week meetings. Um, alhamdulillah, the, the, the team have been very great, very responsive, very respectful. You know, that any, any, anything, you know, they, they had really tried to work closely with, you know, uh, Sharia scholars. They have, really try their best to ensure that everything that they do uh you know even from the marketing messages that they're sending out there to the product itself you know everything you know they have really tried to ensure that it is in line with sharia compliance and that is something that uh, uh people uh, must appreciate because not every project is like that, whether it's in the crypto space or non-crypto space. Sometimes people they do not pay a lot of attention to so many details. And then even, you know, when it comes to marketing, for example, you know, sometimes you may have like a product that is sure compliant, but then the marketing messages or the mar is completely non sharia compliant. Why? Because they probably do not consult with the, the Sharia scholars or they probably feel they do not need to do that. So uh, credit to them, you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, they have, they, they really have tried their best to get everything uh, in accordance with the Sharia, and 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 that is that we can see, you know, like in terms of the engagement I, I, I have had with them, you know, uh, on a very 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 regular basis, and you know, so, so so that is one thing, and this is very important when it comes to understanding the difference. So because Takadao is uh, an insurance product right, or insurance alternative product. That is very important because sometimes people tend to think that there is no difference between a conventional insurance and an Islamic insurance. When in fact, there are so many differences. There are so many differences. I, when I was at uh, university, uh, one of my lecturers, Rob Toys, who was pre prior to be becoming a lecturer, he was a professional in insurance. I remember when we covered the, the module on Islamic insurance. And, you know, when he presented it, and then in the conclusion, he was saying that, oh, you know, uh, you, you know, a lot of people, they got confused because they thought there was no much difference between a conventional insurance and, and an Islamic insurance. Yeah. And, uh, he made it look like like there was no no you know differences at all, and I think he also believed that there was no much difference between, between the two. Uh, but there is a difference, and sometimes we have to understand that. And especially, I get that a lot uh, in the crypto space as well. But sometimes when you look at a product, you may feel that they're both the same. You look at two products, you may feel that they're both the same. And because you think what you know for sure one is halal, and then you're going to look at the other product and you're going to compare it to the first one that is halal, and you're going to think, oh, they look the same, therefore the second one as well is halal. So sometimes you think, well, that conventional insurance and Islamic insurance, they look the same to me, therefore conventional insurance must be halal as well. That is not the case. There is always a very slight difference or many differences. And to understand this concept, uh, we can, this is not something the ulama made. People sometimes, they think, oh, you know, the scholars, they make life difficult, this and that, blah, 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 is nothing like that. This, we can even see it in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about the riba, what does he say? He said, the, the people says, there is no difference between Trade and riba. Mm. 
So the people, they didn't see the difference. They thought they both the same. They saw the end result of a trade and lending with the interest. The end result is the same, that the person is going to make a profit. And they thought it's both the same. Therefore, they're both halal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, there is a difference. There is a difference. Allah, he made one thing halal and the other one he made it halal. When we look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as well, you're going to see these sort of issues. Like, for example, very famous hadith in Sahih Muslim, a person, you know, asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if I was to eat the, the meat of a sheep, do I need to do wudu from it? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, you don't do wudu from that. Okay, if I eat the lamb of a camel, do I need to do wudu after that? Yes, you have to do wudu after that. Why? When you look at it, it's just meat. It's a meat from a halal animal. The camel is a halal animal. The sheep is a halal animal. Then, therefore, why is there a difference between the two? The same hadith, the, the, the person asked the Prophet Sallallahu if I was, uh, you know where you have like the, uh, they call it the, the sheep fall, where the, the, the sheep uh, rest the in the walking place. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and he says, can I pray salada? Can I pray salah? The mm. Prophet said, yes, you can pray. Okay, can I pray salah in the resting places of the, the camel? No, you cannot pray salah. What's the difference? It's, it's a resting place for animals, and the two animals are halal. Yet the Prophet made a difference. Now, when it comes to any type of financial product, including Islamic insurance and a conventional insurance, even if you think the two look the same, there is actually a difference. And in this case, you have rightly mentioned there is difference because one has got the riba involved, one has got, uh, you know, he's got riba, he's got gharar, he's got mesi involved. How? Because, well, in conventional system, when you're paying a premium, when you're paying a premium, and if you were to make a claim, the insurance company is going to pay you money. Okay, he's going to pay you money, and that money is more than the premium that you have done, you, 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 you have paid. Therefore, the money against money, the two of them being, you know, of different amount, there is an interest element involved there. Secondly, the gharal in conventional insurance. Uh, how does that materialize? Well, when you pay for uh, a premium for uh, an insurance policy, you do not know whether you're going to make a claim or not. Maybe you are going to make a claim. If you are going to make a claim, then there's going to be a payout. And if you don't make a claim, then you're going to be losing all your money. The, all the premium you've paid, you've lost it. And you do not know. And for the insurer, he doesn't know, is the person going to make a claim or not? I don't know. How much am I going to be paying? I don't know. So there's a high level of uncertainty involved. So in that sense, there is a form of gambling as well. because. You don't know. Maybe one guy is going to win and the insurer is going to lose. Maybe it's the client who will win and the insurer is going to lose or it's the, the client who is going to lose and the insurer who is going to win. So these elements are present in a conventional insurance. Whether in an Islamic alternative, none of these are available. And in the case, for example, of Takadao, we look at it. Look at, look at the, the ethic behind it. That all the participants from right from the start, what they're saying is that our premium, if ever something was to happen, if there is a payout, we are agreeing to help the members of the community with the money that we're contributing. We are, ha we are happy to let go of it. That in itself is a rewarding act in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you join an insurance policy, how many people buy an insurance policy thinking, oh, my money is going to be helping, you know, the other guys? Nobody thinks like that. Nobody mm -hmm. have got that mentality. But the ins Islamic insurance actually teach you to, to function as a community, that we are all putting our money together to help one another. So it's reinforcing the ties between the Muslim community. Insurance, no, the conventional insurance doesn't do that. It may look like it, it does, but he doesn't do that. Nobody has got that mentality when they're taking out the insurance policy. Nobody cares about the other guy. Secondly, when the, in, in, in Islamic insurance, even in the, 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 the sense of uh, uh, Takadao, 
your premium is being invested on your behalf. It's being invested on your behalf. In a normal insurance, in a conventional insurance, they are going to invest it, but it's surely not for you. Why? How do we know that? Well, if you do not make a claim at, by the end of your insurance policy with a normal conventional one in, in a conventional system, not only you would have lost your premium, they're not going to pay you back your premium. And even if they did invest your premium, they're not going to share a single penny with you in terms of profit. So all the profit they would have made is for themselves, is for the insurer. Whether in an Islamic uh, uh, in, uh, alternative, the money, the fund is being invested on behalf of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the customers on behalf of the people who are contributing into the pool. It means that if by the end of the insurance policy, there is a form of profit, there is a form of surplus, if even after payout, there is something left, they're going to return that money to you. So, so these are, are differences, that tangible differences that we can see. You understand? And of course, you know, like with a conventional insurance, they we don't know what they're going to be doing with the money. They're probably investing in, in, in haram industries. They're probably going to invest in, in, in an industry where they're producing weapons, etc. And these weapons are going to be used in, in, against Muslim. Whether in an Islamic system, not, none of that would happen because the, the, the premium uh, contributed would be invested on your behalf and it will be uh, ensured that it is going to be invested in Sharia compliant avenues that is not going to have a negative impact on society as a whole. And in yeah. many, thank you so much, actually, for that explanation. In many instances as well, you know, they mandated to invest in, you know, government bonds and stuff like that, which are uh, <laughs> severely interest bearing. So um, thank you very much. So if I understand clearly, or just to help the, the listeners, um, you're saying all of that, it applies to um, a, a conventional insurance contract when it is sort of commercial, right? You're buying and, and selling a specific uh, a service here. But when people come together as a community and each person agrees voluntarily, you know, to let go of the due to their brother or sister in times of needs, then, then those different aspects do not apply anymore. Exactly. And uh, this is why, you know, uh, when it comes to Takaful, uh, we should not look at it just as a product or a financial product. We have to look at it as a, uh, something that is, um, how do you call it, that is training our akhlaq, our ethic, that is reinforcing the ties between the believers, between people. Yeah, this is how we need to look at it. We shouldn't just look at it as a burden. Like, I find it a burden, you know, to pay for my car insurance because I know that I don't have a choice. It's because, you know, it's compulsory. But the point is not that. The point is that if I don't make a claim, I'm going to be losing all my money. I'm going to be losing all the, my premium. Whether in Islamic insurance, you need to look at it as a mean that is helping you to be closer to the community. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. And at the same time, we have to look at it that, inshallah, hopefully, if there is nothing happened, then we are going to profit from it. And we're going to profit from it in a halal manner. Because we all have to remember that at the end of the day, uh, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us, how did we earn our money? And where did we actually spend it? Would you rather stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, oh, you know, I did try my best to find an Islamic or a halal solution and I did find my best to find uh, 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 an alternative to haram insurance and I did find my and I spent my money with takadaw for example in, you know just to please you or Allah just to you know because I know it was halal there or would you rather stand in front of Allah and say you know knowing that you didn't make any effort you had the choice and you chose the wrong one and you spent it in a haram manner subhanallah so, just to add just to add to that, may Allah make it easy for us. Just to add to that, you know, it, it's, there's also this uh, question that can come to say, okay, Islamic insurance uh, uh, in 
uh, places that are fortunate, you know, Muslim countries and stuff, it does exist, right? You have the careful industry and whatever, whatever. So why do we need it to be, uh, you know, defied? Uh, why do we need it to be on the blockchain and stuff like that? And so uh, I think it ties very well to the conversation we had in the beginning where we say uh, you can, you know, you can try to uh, Islamify, you know, make Sharia compliant stuff in the in the system that is already there. But when we have another system which is beginning and that we have the chance of actually, you know, influencing it and build it in a way that it respects our sensi- sensitivities for Sharia compliance, then it's, uh, it's extremely important for Muslims to try to do it you know outside of whatever financial system that is currently you know at play and not to talk about other things you know like governance and user journey actual user journey and I like to share my personal story because you know I was one of them right um of course um Takashua doesn't have uh, at the moment a health insurance DAO we're starting with a life uh life DAO life coverage but um I wanted to change my health insurance from the conventional one to a Takaful one, right? So I do everything right. I go to the Takaful company, brick and mortar Takaful here uh, where I live. And at the end of all of it, I get, I signed a contract and everything. I get the, I get an email. Thank you very much. This is your contract. This is your policy or whatever. whatever. You can go to this portal um, to manage and to play schemes and whatever, whatever. And it's the, portal of the old insurance that I wanted to leave subhanallah so a lot comes into place and I don't blame them you know it's like trying to make a square circle of something they are working within that environment and they're doing their best but it doesn't mean as uh, Mufti Bilal has been saying all throughout the podcast that we sit back and we say there's nothing different we can do if there is a better way that comes outside of that financial um, system then it's our duty you know it's, uh, I'm very happy for the team to be working on something like that all right do you want to add something on why we need blockchain for that you know um i think you know at the end of the day uh muslims we as muslim we have to uh be clever and adopt uh solutions that are going to have a positive impact on our uh, ourselves as individual and as a community and the impact that blockchain can have on the community is much more greater than if it was to not use blockchain. And one of the best examples that we can give, especially when it comes to product like uh, Takadao, is the fact that it's an insurance, it's Islamic insurance uh, alternative product that can be accessible by any Muslim from around the world. That's a key word. That's a key cool word. And if it wasn't because of blockchain, nobody would have had access. You know, like I said to you, you know, in, in, in France, there is no Islamic insurance. In, 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 in the UK, there is no Islamic insurance. And, you know, now you have, with the blockchain, there is a solution. So this is one, one of the biggest reasons. The solutions that blockchain can provide to uh, the Muslim community is really, we are not going to understand, you know, until we're going to see it, you know, in probably five years or 10 years time, when we're going to start seeing, and I'm hoping that one day, inshallah, that you, we can even get to the point where a person who lives in a, in, in a country when they do not have access, for example, to uh, buying a house in a share compliant manner, well, they will be able to buy their house in a share compliant manner, not by going to the bank, but by raising funds from the community through the block uh, through, through a blockchain the beauty of blockchain also is this the, the, the security the transparency things that you're not going to find you know in a normal conventional system so blockchain we we have to use blockchain because we should always adopt technology and solutions that are going to have to bring positive impact on on, on the community Thank you so much, Mufti Bilal. Um, a, a, a sea, subhanAllah, of insight. I have learned a lot, and you guys, you've heard. Similarity in appearance doesn't mean similarity in, uh, you know, uh, 
verdict you know in terms of whether or not it's Sharia compliant each of you guys have to do your own due diligence and for those who are building Sharia compliant uh, products make sure that you're communicating them as Sharia compliant uh, uh, as possible uh, again I remember you know looking looking out for to purchase a car subhanAllah and I, I'm trying to make to do it the right way and the guy on the other phone you know the, the bank agent and what have you it's like madam just take it this way just take it this way I'm like what do you mean uh it's like they're not Sharia compliant I'm like you work at this place and you say it's all the same it's not Sharia compliant so of course it's 50 50 I mean you have to learn and we have to do our part and together we come and we make the Muslim community stronger globally thank you so much Mufti Bilal do you have any closing words where can people find you uh, you can they can find me you know on, on, on LinkedIn and the uh, closing remark is really like I think like you said uh, I'm just going to repeat that is you have to do your due diligence when it comes to investing in crypto uh, whether it's uh, a product is a scam or it's not a scam or whether the product is going to actually bring you because not all all product you know is like a uh, a magic tree right you're probably not going to make you any profit yeah even if it's halal sometimes even if a halal product doesn't mean something halal does not mean that it's going to bring you baraka in your wealth in the sense that you're going to see money grow sometimes people have this misconception seeking halal is only to please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the reward can either be in this world or the hereafter the reward can come either in in the sense that your wealth is going to grow if it doesn't grow, maybe in the hereafter, the reward is going to grow. Okay, we have to have that sort of mentality. And and yeah, we have to do our due diligence when it comes to halal and specifically because there are many, uh, many things out there that are completely not, not halal. And uh, you have to also support, you know, uh, one thing I will say is people sometimes they say to me, oh, but then how do we adopt blockchain technology? Or how do we create a, a crypto product? And I said to them, I said, look, if you have the ability, if you have the technical know-how, this and that, you, you should do it. But if you don't, then you should at least support that the Muslim actors that are bringing a solution to the community. The minimum, the least you can do is support them, support the product. That's a minimum that you can do. Thank you so much, you guys. Support us and support this episode by leaving, you know, thumbs up, like, comments, you know, tell us in the comment section which, uh, which insights you got from this. Um, subscribe, watch the other episodes and see you in the next one. Thank you very much, Mufti Bilal. Have a great one, everyone.